Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, well, uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, present. I'm sorry that we didn't get to do it in person. I have uh, had previously some uh, nice um, uh, visits to um, to Trieste and also to um, Kerala. To the, I was at the ISA in Kerala, um, and I've also um, been to Tata Institute. So, and some of my collaborators I will talk about are at Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. So, in the first part, I want to do a tutorial and talk about effective Hamiltonians for quantum dynamics in um, functional molecular materials. And uh, Christina kindly mentioned my blog, Condensed Concepts. And so I put slides, copies of the slides on, um, on the blog. So you can find them there. But there's also um, wide ranging discussions about uh, many scientific issues that relate to the theme of this, um, to this meeting, and also some broader um, uh, comments um, and job advice, especially for young people. So, uh, so this in the tutorial, I'll first of all explain what I mean by functional molecular materials including biomolecules. And then I'll give some examples of quantum dynamical processes. And then a key idea in modeling is to partition the whole system into a discrete quantum system and an environment. An environment may be a solvent or a protein. And then I'll introduce the, the form of um, model effective Hamiltonians because they often have a common form. And then a particularly important idea <clears throat> is that of diabatic states and how they lead to potential energy surfaces. And in the second half on the research, I'll talk about diabatic states and hydrogen bonding. And then to just to illustrate um, uh, the sort of what these models can do, I'll talk about one of the simplest possible models the spin boson um, model. Okay, so in terms of the big picture, the we have a scientific and a technological challenge, and that is that at the atomic and molecular level, we want to understand and learn to control a number of processes, charge transport and charge separation, whether it involves electrons or protons, we want to do energy conversion, like converting light to chemical energy or to electrical energy. And we want to transport energy and store energy. And we also want to selectively break and make chemical bonds, um, and particularly to do it in a very efficient way, and so to do cat catalysis. Well, biomolecules do all these things very well. And so Hopefully by studying them, we can get ideas of how with artificial systems, we might um, uh, be able to do these things. But there's not just a technological challenge, it's also of this fundamental scientific interest. This is just one example of um, you know, how your eye works, <laughs> how you see things. Well, there is here, you, there is this molecule um, here, rhodopsin, and this is in a, a protein retinal, and you can see that it's embedded in some membrane protein. And um, the key thing of what happens is a photon is absorbed by the um, rhodopsin, and then here there's a cis double bond, and then there's a twist of the bond in response um, to the excitation by light, and then you have a new um, conformation of the molecule. And then this leads 
to charge separation in the protein and uh, a electrical signal. That's how your eye works. And so this is a highly efficient and fast conversion of photons to electrical energy. So we'd like to understand that. And we'd also like to find ways to mimic it. So um, these are examples, other examples of quantum dynamical processes in functional materials. So a photovoltaic cell, take a photon, produces an exciton, which can be viewed as an electron hole pair. And then you want to um, that to decay into a separated electron in a hole, and that will then produce a voltage. Um, or a light emitting diode is the reverse process where a voltage produces a spatially separated electron in hole, and then you want them to combine to produce the exciton, which will then decay radiatively to produce a photon. Now, Basically, this kind of functionality requires some transitions between different quantum states. And so uh, we would like to be able to describe um, to describe those transitions. And so there's quantum dynamics involved. But how are we going to, to, to model this? This is just another example, and this is just to illustrate the complexity, this is an organic LED um, is based on this chromophore. And this will have more than 40 nuclei and more than 300 electrons. And so there's actually 10 to the 100 electronic quantum states. And so um, you're going to have to simplify things a lot. And that's just to describe the, um, the chromophore, let alone the environment. Um, and so the, the some big picture observations here, and particularly this is where I come as a physicist, is there's a tension between specificity or particularity and universality. And so when, in different words, for complex molecular materials, when do the details, um, uh, when do the details matter? Now, physicists generally say the details don't matter. Physicists think cows are spherical and like to use the smallest possible model. In contrast, chemists say the details really um, do matter. And biologists say the details are a map of life and death because you just have one mutation or, um, and then, then um, before you know it, you, 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 you have, end up with cancer or um, some disease. Uh, so um, this is the theoretical challenge is to, to find a balance between these different um, um, perspectives. And particularly because if there's quantum dynamics involved, you can't do um, any modeling that involves every treating every single atom quantum mechanically. Um, and so there's different levels of theory and modeling. Um, and it's not that one is better than another. Um, it, we actually need all of them. So it's simple phenomenology where you just have a, a theory without atomic or molecular details, like when you do classical rate equations. And some things, systems, you can understand some of what's going on. Now, in classical molecular dynamics, generally you include all of the atoms, but you're treating them. Um, they're not allowing for quantum effects. And in computational quantum chemistry, you're starting with Schrodinger's equation or a density functional for all of the electrons or some subset um, of them. But what I'm going to be talking about is um, something different, which is very common in condensed matter physics, which is my background where you work with model effective Hamiltonians, famous ones, the Hubbard model, Heisenberg model, Anderson model. And these are just described the low energy degrees of, um, of um, freedom. Um, so you, you're not treating all everything there. So to make this concrete in terms of um, 
the kind of systems people are interested in this workshop. Here's a picture of the, the photoactive yellow protein. And there's a chromophore here, and then it's surrounded by a protein, but there's also water and um, in the, the, the water environment. And so a key idea is to partition um, the system in the following manner, that you think of that there's some subset here, which may involve a relatively small number of atoms, such as the chromophore, and you have um, just a limited number of electronic states you focus on such as the ground state and the electronic excited state. And then there's an environment. And then in biomolecules, you'll have the protein. You also have the water bound to the protein. And then there's bulk water out here. And that can, all of these can play a, 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 significant, um, uh, a significant role. And so shortly, I'll give you an example of how you might um, do this. So there's a, a general form um, for the effective Hamiltonian. And this basically there's this partition, if you like, where you have the molecular electronic states, and I'll talk about diabatic states shortly, but there's also the molecular nuclear coordinates. So this is generally just the chromophore. Um, and then you have all these environmental degrees of freedom. And so then the, you can partition the Hamiltonian into three parts. One part is just describing the system, which we would call, um, this would be the, um, the basically the molecule, the chromophore, and, um, the, and then there's the environment and the um, and then there's the system environment interaction. So I, I, if you look in the, the literature, the, um, the, there's sort of a common um, fall uh, that these effective Hamiltonians have. And so the first part um, is um, where you think in terms of a limited number of diabatic states but then they have coefficients which depend on the molecular vibrational coordinates, such as um, the, the stretching of bonds or angles um, involved. And later I'll show an example from hydrogen bonding. Now, if we look at the eigenvalues of this matrix, because this is not necessarily diagonal, that will give you potential energy surfaces. Now, the way to model the environment, the simplest possible model is just an infinite collection of harmonic oscillators. And then you need a, a system environment coupling. And the simplest possible form is where you have uh, some vibrational coordinate from the environment that's coupling linearly to the um, uh, to these electronic states. But then you can also couple um, the vibrational um, uh, coordinates. Now, the details are here aren't so important, but just that that's a general form. Uh, so let me talk about diabatic states. And so it's good, easiest way to understand them is to think of a simple example. Suppose we had a sodium chloride molecule. Well, at, we know that the ground state is going to be ionic. There'll be a sodium plus ion and a chlorine minus ion. And then we can think about as that electronic state, as you vary the distance between the two the ions, then that how will that energy evolve? And that is this curve here. And we call this a diabatic state because of the, this is not, um, the electronic character isn't staying, it's changing. So all that's happening as I go from here up to here, I'm maintaining the electronic character. Whereas in contrast, if I have the, the neutral atoms at large separations, when they're far apart, the, the ground state 
the stable state is the the neutral um, uh, the neutral atom atomic state. And then as you move those two neutral atoms closer together, then that energy of that state, will, electronic state, will increase up to here. Now, in reality, though, <coughs> those two states are coupled together. And so the actual eigenstates, or if we call the adiabatic states, which define potential energy surfaces, are these two curves here. And so the ground state is a sodium chloride ion, but the first excited state is the, the neutral at atoms where you have charge transfer. Now, um, in terms of generally, the key properties of diabatic states is that they are many body electronic quantum states and they don't, the electronic part doesn't vary significantly with the nuclear coordinates. And this, the, some of the power of this is it connects with chemical intuition. We can just think of simply um, or, you know, high school chemistry of ionic states, neutral states. Um, and so the energy of these states has a simple dependence on the, the nuclear um, coordinates. And so we come now to what most of us are more familiar with, which is potential energy surfaces. And they're basically the adiabatic states, which are the energy eigenstates. And so this is where you have the, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, and you might have some complex molecule, and this would be the ground state surface, and this would be the excited state surface. And one thing that's of particular importance from photodynamics is these surfaces can touch at what's called a conical intersection. And you can have very fast non-radiative decay um, through this conical intersection. And that's particularly important in, um, for example, um, fluorescent uh, um, proteins. Okay, so... The diabatic states have many advantages. Um, they can elucidate the conical intersections between potential energy services. They have a simple coupling to the environment and they can be constructed from quantum chemistry. And um, they also allow going beyond the, the Born-Oppenheimer Born um, approximation. So now let me talk about a, um, a concrete um, example. And this is probably the simplest possible model that could describe um, non-trivial quantum dynamics where you have a system plus the environment. So this is called the spin boson model. Um, and the spin bit is, is there's no physical spin. It's just because you use Pauli matrices um, to describe two quantum states. So you have two quantum states and there's an energy difference between them. And so here, epsilon, here you have a term for that with the, the Z Pauli matrix. And then there's this term, which is coupling the two states together. Um, now, then there is um, the environment is described by an infinite collection of harmonic oscillators. And so here's the harmonic oscillators. And then you consider the simplest possible coupling of these harmonic oscillators, which these are here creation annihilation operators, and um, to the, um, the, the sigma z. Now, this model is very simple to write down, but it has very non-trivial quantum dynamics. And it can describe a whole range of processes that would be of interest to people at this meeting. Um, so uh, um, it can describe electron transfer, Forster resonant energy transfer, internal conversion, or non-radiative decay, Inter-system crossing due to spin-orbit coupling, 
and then also hydrogen bonding and proton transfer. And uh, the second talk I'll describe um, that. So um, in terms of the, the system, trying to parameterize it, um, what's interesting um, is that even though you have this complex form um, that the two, the effect of the environment on the quantum dynamics of the two states is completely determined by this quantity, which is known as the spectral density. And so it's a measure of the coupling to the quantum system and to the different modes and also what the frequency of those modes are of the environment. And then there's sort of two main parameters that parameterize this spectral density. One's called the reorganization energy, which is um, the tote, which is the, an integral over J of omega. And then there's the typical relaxation frequency of the bath or all the harmonic oscillators. So then if you study the, the model, um, uh, then I'll show you the, the different types of quantum dynamics. But in terms of what kind of dynamics happens, determined by the fact that you've got competing energy and time scales. So for example, you've got the thermal energy about 200 centimeters to minus one at room temperature. And that corresponds to a temperature scale of like 25 femtoseconds. But then you have this reorganization energy, the relaxation time of the environment, the coupling of the two states, the energy difference. Now in biomolecules, depending on the process that you're involved in, these energy scales can span from one to a thousand centimeters to minus one. And so sometimes um, one of them is much larger than another. It just depends on the system. Uh, so let's look at the dynamics. So this is, um, um, turns out to be highly non-trivial just to, to show, to establish these three curves. So Leggett and Tony Leggett and Caldera and Weiss and, Others have spent a lot of um, time working on this, but it turns out there's three possibilities. Um, and so this is an example where I'll, I'll show for, if you had fret, where here you had an um, excited state of one molecule and the other molecule was not an excited state. And then there's um, transition to when the, 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 the you transition to the excitation moves on to the other molecule. And so you can start, um, it depends on the regime, but you can start in a situation where the excitation oscillates backwards and forwards. And so we'd call this coherence because um, that involves um, quantum coherence between these two um, states. Um, so this is showing the location of exciton versus time. Now, incoherent transfer is where um, there's no oscillation and then there's just exponential decay of slowly this is moving from the excitation from here to here. The other possibility is when the coupling to the environment is strong enough, the excitation is just completely localized on one of the molecules. And that will only happen at zero temperature um, or effectively if um, very low temperatures. Um, so, um, and delta is the, the scale of the frequency of the oscillation here. Um, so um, there's, um, quite a lot of interest and controversy about particularly in photosynthetic systems to what extent you have this um, quantum um, coherence. Um, but, and quantum coherence makes things interesting, but decoherence is actually good too, because of that for functional processes, you, you, you actually want complete transfer. You want to go from, um, you know, from one state to the other. So um, 
And so here, even though there's coherence in the end, you, you end up with transfer of the energy um, excitation. Um, I'll just give you another example of something analysis you can do in the incoherent regime. Um, and this is um, the Marcus Hush theory for electron transfer that Marcus received the Nobel Prize in chemistry for. And so that's in a particular parameter regime. And what you find, you can calculate the rate of transfer. And there's a nice um, analytic form for that, which um, Marcus and Hush um, derived independently. Um, and I'll just give you an example of how this um, can um, give you, if you like, a design principle um, that uh, if you look at this rate as, um, as a function of the energy difference um, between the two electronic states, um, then you see a exponential, so there's a parabola, this is a logarithmic scale. And there's, so there's a particular energy difference, the maximum rate when the relaxation energy equals the energy difference between the states. And this was a very, this graph here shows experimental data for a whole range of different uh, molecules where there's electron transfer. Um, and it nicely is consistent um, with the, the theory. And you can apply these ideas um, in other contexts to explaining um, the um, um, looking at um, design principles um, for organic um, solar cells. Uh, so I should move along here um, and just mention um, finally uh, this um, to give if you want a concrete example in a biomolecular system of how you might do this modeling, here's a case where you'd have a, a, a dipole, which might be excited state of a molecule. And so that's the chromophore. And then um, it's embedded in some protein. Um, and that is then embedded in the, in the solvent. And in this paper, we um, uh, were able to investigate the different regimes and particularly um, because of that, there's different dielectric constants and different dielectric relaxation um, times. So I should um, finish up that um, there are um, lots of outstanding questions here. Um, and so I won't um, go over um, these now. Uh, so, oh, and these are just some of the, the papers that um, I have been involved in over the years of addressing some of these issues. But uh, particularly in the second part, I'll talk about hydrogen bonding and um, proton transfer. So um, let me um, end um, there and I'm... Um, open to um, having uh, questions. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction. So um, you can uh, write uh, your questions uh, in the chat or uh, you can simply switch on uh, the microphone and ask. So don't be shy. <laughs> you can uh, you can ask some question. I will uh, start with the first one. Um, I really appreci uh, appreciate this uh, um, general idea of having effective Hamiltonians in order to uh, describe and to investigate um, uh, very complex systems. 
Uh, so the first question is, how do you convince chemists uh, that uh, the details uh, do not uh, matter? Because this is an issue, I think. And the other question is about the parameterization. So uh, are you usually um, take the parameters from the uh, experimental, uh, from the experiments, or uh, uh, do you think it is better uh, to go to, to have another approach? Um, okay, so the first question of convincing um, chemists, yeah, that all the details don't matter. Uh, um, well, yeah, that's a, a thing, I think, and I think sometimes the details do matter. That's, and that's the tension that is, is figuring out um, what, um, details um, do matter. And I, I think that the, the best way to convince them is of some success. So I will, um, uh, the second half, I'll talk about work I did on hydrogen bonding. And, and that's definitely, I mean, been much more successful than I thought it would be. And, and, and so there's chemists who are, are, are you know, using um, the, the, the model I, I, I developed. So I think that that's the only way to, you know, and that's fair enough to convince people is to show that sometimes simple models can capture details of very wide ranges of materials. Um, so in terms of the parameterization, um, there's um, sort of two ways you can do things. And I think both have strengths and weaknesses. You can do parameterization often from some quantum chemistry or molecular dynamics, um, but you can also um, sometimes from experiment, you can parameterize things. So this paper here, I mean, we did both. Um, so the key quantity that you're interested in is this um, spectral density. And so there's a way you can extract this from, from uh, experiment by looking at the, um, uh, the, the time decay of um, optical excitations. And so that can be done. And so in the paper, there's a big long table with parameters for all sorts of proteins and with, with chromophores. But we also, in that paper, we, we, we had this model, um, which is an Onsaga type model, where you've got, a di you've got sort of three dielectric mediums, each has a dielectric constant and relaxation time. And from that, you can extract a, um, a form, a functional form um, for the, um, uh, for this spectral density. And you can also get the spectral density from classical molecular um, dynamics um, simulations. There's various tricks for, for, for doing that. So, and then with the green fluorescent protein um, uh, with Seth Olson, we were able to characterize the, you know, the diabetic states. Um, yeah, so it's a, I think it's really important to, to do both um, because of that quantum chemistry has its limitations, molecular dynamics have their limitations, uh, but their strengths, but then, uh, and, and again, extracting things from experiment is not always straightforward, but can be quite insightful. Thank you. So uh, we have uh, a question in the chat from Mesh. Mesh, do you want to ask uh, yourself or? Uh... Oh, okay. So the question is, can you elaborate on how decoherence can be useful? Um, well, maybe it's that um, if, um, yeah, so this goes back to, Okay, let me go back to, so when I was saying, yeah, okay. Um, well, it's, 
put it this way, if you, if you, I'll flip it round and say, right, maybe I should have put it this way. Coherence can be useless <laughs> because if you had um, complete coherence, for example, then this thing would just op oscillate backwards and forwards from perpetuity. And so if you're thinking about elect, you know, electron transfer, for example, and you would be in, in a completely coherent regime, then um, that would mean that the electron would just oscillate backwards and forward between the donor and the acceptor. And so you'd never get the, the process you want happening. So in your eye, <laughs> You know, the photon would be absorbed and um, you'd get an electron in a hole, say, and they would just um, be oscillate. They would never um, get separated from, from each other. So, so in that sense, yeah, it's a good question. I probably should say that, put it around the other way, that um, co coherent, pure, complete coherence, um, would would be useful for useless for any real process you wanted. Um, uh, yeah. Um. Okay. Okay. Other comments from the audience. If uh, not, possibly the quantum state. There is uh, um, something about uh, uh, a comment about uh, Kama Redad, but uh, I cannot understand. So can you switch on uh, your microphone and ask? Uh, hello. Do yes. You hear me? Yeah. Um, so, hello, Mr. Ross. Thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, we are talking here about molecules and we are talking about uh, quantum physics. Uh, as we know that for quantum physics, the state of the state we don't have uh, we don't, we have a probability to find a state. To, to, to have a particle in state. For example, here we are talking about the electronic uh, structure of our molecules. So uh, uh, this, uh, we will not meet a problem in experience when we are talking about uh, applying uh, quantum physics in this field of biology. Yeah, so this is a, a controversial issue of, of you know, most of biology you think of in terms of classical um, physics that, you know, the, you know, the protein is in a definite conformation and then maybe the protein changes to another conformation. You don't have a Schrodinger's cat state where the protein is in the, the two conformations simultaneously. Uh, and similarly, you don't have a chromophore in the ground state and the electron, the electronic decides at the same time. But there are processes, you know, at the biomolecular level, when you get down to the size of a, you know, a chromophore, such as when you have fret or when you have exciton transfer between chromophores in photosynthesis, that where that um, can, there can be quantum coherence there. Now, that's um, uh, the, the time scale of that is often quite short. It's often, um, you know, tens of femtoseconds, maybe hundreds of femtoseconds. But I think the controversy is, well, there's controversy about to what extent this happens in different biomolecular systems, but also whether it's, important for the functionality of the of the of the biomolecule and 
I'm on the camp that that I'm very skeptical that that it is important for the functionality, and also that I think some of the um, experiments that were done and got a lot of attention claiming quantum coherence in photosynthesis, I think, were overinterpreted, and since then that it's there. Um, there's simpler explanations. Uh, so, so, but um, yeah, so for most of biology, quantum physics, I don't think is relevant, but if we're looking at short time scales and short distances, you know, everything is uh, quantum mechanical, like it's, you know, chemistry, once you're breaking and making chemical bonds, that's, um, I'd say that's intrinsically quantum, yeah. Okay, so I think it is time to move to the second part of the talk. And uh, of course, we will have time at the end for, uh, for uh, other questions. Hmm. Okay, now we're good. Okay, so now. So, um, okay, so everyone's seen the, the um, something about hydrogen bonding. Okay, um, so. Um, I also put copies of these slides um, on the blog if you want. Um, so I'm going to talk about the effect of quantum nuclear motion on hydrogen bonding in complex molecular materials. And just following up on that last question, this is a case where yeah, you do see um, quantum effects in um, some biomolecular system. And so just to, um, to, to motivate uh, that uh, I will um, show um, th th this just this is just a recent paper from Steve Fox's group at um, Stanford unusual spectroscopic and electric field sensitivity of chromophores with short hydrogen bonds green fluorescent protein and um, uh, this is the yellow fluorescent protein as model systems. And um, this is a picture of the chromophore. And then there's a, a hydrogen atom or proton that can transfer between the, the protein and um, the, the molecule. And the details here are not important, but this, what, for, what I'm going to talk about, but the point is, um, these kind of pictures, this is you're going to see again and again in the talk. And this and the boxes group, they use this model that I'm going to talk about now to, 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 to interpret a lot of the, the experiments. So um, so let's go to the to the model now. Okay. And so again, a physicist, not a chemist, looking at or a biologist looking at hydrogen bonding. And so my three goals are to, to find the simplest possible model to describe a wide range of phenomena and materials and to elucidate the role of quantum physics. So if you look in a um, chemistry textbook, uh, you know, introductory chemistry textbook in high school or even first year university, it will um, 
you know, have this kind of uh, cartoon of the hydrogen bond and that it's all electrostatic um, interactions. And this is a classical picture. Now, often the, 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 that's in a lot of situations that is capturing the essence, but it's not in all cases. And so that's what this talk is about. And so we've got this concept of potential energy surfaces and you know, this underscores so much of our understanding of, um, of, of, of chemistry uh, and that um, basically you can understand most of chemistry in terms of the dynamics of atoms is described by classical motion on a potential energy surface. And this is based on the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. But I want to show you an example where this is not the case. Uh, so um, I'll talk about this simple model for potential energy surfaces for hydrogen bonds. And it turns out quantum nuclear effects are necessary for quantitative description of correlations between donor accepted distance R, big R, and bond lengths and vibrational frequencies. And the quantum effects, which you can see through isotope effects where you replace hydrogen with deuterium are largest and most subtle for when you have moderate to strong symmetric hydrogen bonds and the relevant distance is about 2.4 to 2.5 um, ang angstroms. So this is a very important picture for this, for this talk. And so, um, and I'll, I'll keep showing it just so you don't forget, but let's suppose you have this hydrogen bond where you've got some molecule. Now, X here could be something very complicated. Um, I mean, it could be part of a protein or something. And then there's a covalent bond to hydrogen atom. And then there's this hydrogen bond to some um, other complex molecule. Now, um, we call this the donor and the acceptor. Now, the three, there's four parameters here. One is just what's the distance between the donor and the acceptor between X and Y. And that turns out to be a very key variable. And then there's also this distance, the, 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 this length, and then there's this angle. Um, so let's see how important that is. So what um, was established over many years and nicely summarized by this book um, by Gilly and Gilly, I think father and daughter, um, and um, is that you can find all these correlations for hundreds of different chemical com compounds. Um, and so I'll show you some of these correlations um, now to get the flavor of things. So the, the, the bond length, that is the distance between um, the, the donor, well, the donor, the, in this case, it's OH. Um, now, normally in isolated atom, this would be like about one angstrom. Now, as you vary the, this distance between um, the X and the Y, and these are, now this is for a symmetric complex. Um, what you see is there's a definite trend here, okay? And these, um, and this is for um, each data point here is a different chemical compound from the Cambridge crystallographic database. And sometimes these are quite complex molecules. Um, and so this is something we wanna be able to explain both qualitatively and quantitative, why you get this correlation here. And then you can also measure the, the, the stretch frequency. Um, and what you um, see is, again, there's a definite trend. Now, an isolated OH stretch would be about 3,500 centimeters to minus one. And, um, but what you find is that that gets incredibly soft as the, the hydrogen bond gets shorter and shorter and that when it's down towards 2.4 angstroms, as in the distance here between the two oxygen atoms, 
um, it, the frequency has you know dropped by like um, as you know like fourfold. Now that's a huge change. I mean, most chemical bonds, um, the vibrational frequencies, you know, might change by a few percent, not by a factor or you know three or or something. So um, this is something also then that needs to be explained. And again, each one of these is a different compound, um, uh, and so there's some universality here. Okay, and so. We need a potential energy surface. And I'm going to show a simple model Hamiltonian, which really only has two free parameters. It's physically and chemically transparent. And it gives a unified picture of different types of hydrogen bonds and of proton transfer. And it can give a semi quantitative description of all these empirical correlations. Um, and so we come back to the diabetic states. And so the idea is to construct diabetic states for a hydrogen bond. Well, again, you go to chemical intuition. And so you think about, well, let's have, um, we have an isolated um, um, covalent bond between the X and the, the proton. And then you have a long way away, you have the Y, which is the acceptor, or you move the proton over here. And so that's a second electronic state. And they just differ by transfer of a proton. Now you can describe the energy of these states just individually by a, a Morse potential. Um, and so you can parameterize that just from a, um, from what you know about these isolated bonds. Um, so you could just take gas phase values for isolated molecules. Now you want, the key thing though, is how do you couple these two diabetic states together? And so there's this off diagonal coupling um, and there's a intuitive way again to parameterize this. And that if um, we think about if this is a linear situation, we don't have to worry about this angle. And then we would just expect that this would decay exponentially as the R gets bigger. And so there's the overall scale here, which we call delta one. So that's one parameter. And then there's B here, which is just describing how that falls off exponentially. Now, then if you think in terms of simple overlaps of molecular orbitals, you can argue that as you vary the direction of the, the bond, that then there'll be this simple um, um, dependence. And so there's no new parameters there. Okay. So now you look at the energy eigenvalues, a two by two matrix, you know what the eigenvalues are, they look like that, and that defines potential energy surfaces. And so this is what the surface would look like. Um, if you say you chose um, a distance of 2.9 angstrom, and this is for when the, um, the symmetry here between the donor and the acceptor. And so this is what you see is the, the these are the two diabetic states, there's weak coupling, and then there's a large potential energy barrier to transfer the proton. And so we'd say this is a weak hydrogen bond. But then as you move the molecules closer, um, just to 2.6 angstrom, what you find is that that potential energy barrier is now getting a lot smaller. And so an example of this um, uh, would be this, where you have hydroxyl and a, um, uh, um, water molecule. I think the Zundel cation is, a, is another one. And um, so um, if you then look, and we will shortly at quantum mechanically, that the first case when you have this high barrier, um, the, um, there is um, very little splitting or tunneling between these states. There's only tunneling up here. But when the barrier is low, um, 
there's only actually one state below the barrier. Um, and so this is called a low barrier hydrogen bond. And there's a lot of controversy about whether or not they, to what extent they exist in proteins and whether they're important for catalysis. Um, and so this is actually the Zundel cation. And now when the distance is much shorter, there's actually no barrier here. And so the proton would be completely delocalized um, between the two. So now let's try and do a, so just review. This captures three classes of hydrogen bonds, weak um, bonds, strong bonds, moderate bonds, or low, also known as low barrier hydrogen bonds. And also it can describe a proton transfer reaction. And there's something called the pKa equalization principle, um, which really and really come up. And this also captures this. And this just relates to moving the bar the diabetic states relative to one another. Okay, so now we want to talk about quantum nuclear effects. So we use the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, but we need to find the Schrodinger equation for the vibrational eigenstates for say an XH stretch. So this is the eigenvalue that gives the potential energy surface. And then here you have the nuclear mass. And so this is going to be different for hydrogen and for deuterium. And so if you solve this equation, suppose to this regime, you have this barrier, and then there's a ground state here. So this would, um, and then the, um, that's the energy, that's the zero point energy. And then here, this is the ground state probability energy density. And so you can note that the proton is more or less completely delocalized between the two, the donor and the acceptor. But you also note that if it was classical, the proton would sit right here. Okay. That would be the it would it would be localized there. And that would be the bond length. Okay. But if it's um, more delocalized, the most probable place to find it would be here or here. And so that is a different length. And that would be the bond length you would measure in a neutron scattering experiment. Okay, so let's now take that, uh, the information. Okay, so this is all the data I showed before. This is the length of the, this bond XH versus big R. And so that's all the data and if it was, if things were classical, this would be where the line would occur. That's where the minimum of the potential energy is. But if you allow for the quantum effects, what you see is that it's significantly different and you'll get this red curve for, and that's for hydrogen, and then you'll get this curve for deuterium. And so this is also predicting a isotope geometric isotope effect that hydrogen and deuterium, they would have different bond lengths. Um, now there's more you can do is that you calculate the, um, the frequency. So here, if this was the well, and then you, there was a small splitting, there would be an energy difference between those two, which is here. But the excited that you would see in an infrared absorption experiment would be a transition from this state to that state. And so that's what this curve is. Okay. And so again, that <clears throat> can capture a lot of the trend that's seen in experimental data. Now, if it was purely classical, then if you were looking at just the, the parabola down here, you would have this curve. And so <clears throat> it shows that <clears throat> the zero point motion um, is quite is, um, is quite important. The quantum effects are quite important. But also that as though the model is quite simple, it can quantitatively describe all um, you know this, this very broad trend over many materials. Now, suppose you think about um, bending. 
So this is where the this angle with the oscillating, and you can calculate that and what you see, and this is compared to data. And again, there's no new parameters coming in here, and that trend is is well captured. Um, uh, so notice that as the R vary here, this frequency is getting um, as the, they get further apart that um, frequency gets smaller, whereas when the, the oscillation, the linear oscillation, the stretch um, gets, um, uh, gets harder. And so there's the opposite trend. And so this is a um, important point is that the stretch in decreases with decreasing R, but the the bend increases with decreasing up. So there's some zero point energy associated with this, and that's decreasing and decreasing R, and the bend zero point energy is increasing with decreasing R. And so there's actually a competition between these two. And this is um, an important concept. Um, it turns out, and that the chemists, particularly Tom Markland at um, Stanford, theoretical chemist, a lot of the, the path integral Monte Carlo simulations and such that he'd done, that this model can, can nicely um, capture the trends. Uh, and so the zero point energy is the main source of these isotope effects, particularly the secondary geometric effect. Okay, and so let me just show you that now. So suppose that you replace the hydrogen with deuterium, then this distance is going to change. Now it only changes by about one hundredth of an angstrom, um, and then this is a, a graph of that change for, for many different compounds versus R versus the distance between the, the donor and acceptor. Now. You could look at this and think, oh, there's no trend here at all. <laughs> um, uh, and also you could think, oh, there's pretty bad data, but bear in mind, you're measuring bond lengths to within a hundredth of an angstrom. Uh, so, but if you do a detailed analysis um, with, this, um, with this model, um, what, you, um, what you find is the, is the following that, um, if you only do the calculation with the stretch zero point energy, you get this. But if you do it um, with the, um, uh, the stretch and the bend zero point energy, and so they're competing with each other. And so there's a distance out here at which you get um, uh, the, the sign of the geometric isotope effect changes. And, and it turns out water is sort of, in, just in this regime. And this is something Markland and others had noted earlier that they see this subtle competition between the two um, uh, effects. Um, and so in water, the com sorry about that. In water, the competing um, quantum effects are um, almost um, cancel, it's almost exactly cancel each other. Um, and okay, so and again, we're not introducing any new parameters um, to describe uh, this this data. Okay, so the model we've extended to other um, contexts. So in um, proteins, um, people do isotopic fractionation where you um, add um, heavy water, and then you find out how much deuterium ends up in the protein at particular sites. And so you can use this as a, uh, as a measure of the hydrogen bond length. And so um, this paper, which was done with people at Indian Institute of Science, um, like the, one of the earlier papers, uh, that <coughs> um, uh, can, it gives quite a bit of insight into that. Then uh, you can also talk about double proton transfer, the diabatic state model for that. 
And then more recently, we looked at the infrared absorption intensity. So hydrogen bonds greatly enhance um, the infrared absorption intensity. And so uh, this is a detailed analysis um, of that. Um, so let me um, end. Um, so this two diabatic state model provides a nice parameterization of potential energy surfaces on a very broad range of materials. And the quantum nuclear effects are necessary for a quantitative description of correlations between donor accepted distance and bond lengths and vibrational frequencies. And these isotope, oh, sorry, these um, isotope effects, which are a measure of the, the quantum nuclear effect, are largest and they're most subtle when you have moderate to strong symmetric bonds. And this is the regime where, yeah, there's quite, where these short, yeah, well, these bonds occur in quite a few um, proteins, including the ones I alluded to originally with some of the fluorescent um, proteins. Um, this is, if you want to learn more, this is probably the, the best um, paper to start. Um, uh, and I put copies of the slides on the blog and there's lots of discussion on the blog about um, related issues. There's probably like 50 posts on hydrogen bonding or something, yeah. Okay, so. Um, Thank you. Oh. Thank, thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, uh, lecture. And uh, I think that uh, the results are uh, uh, quite impressive in the sense that uh, uh, a very simple model is able to reproduce a lot of experimental data. So uh, is there any, yes, there is a comment, Anna, please. Possibly you cannot unmute. Uh, Okay, yes. now now it's worked. Sorry, they had to give me a permit. Uh, I was thanks for the beautiful uh, talk, very elegant as usual is the case with your talks and your work. Um, just a curiosity, of course. Uh, um, you have this, uh, and most probably is a stupid question, but when you have uh, uh, short distances, okay. you're uh, uh, basically you have a. a, a not a single minimum, almost so in the ground state, but then you have uh, the excited state potentially the surface, um, mm -hmm. which is the energy of this uh, excited state uh, and which is the nature of this excited state. It is accessible experimentally. Ah, oh, that's a wonderful, I think that's a super, that's, a one, that's one of my favorite questions. Let me, take me a minute, let me just get to, where that's addressed. Okay, I think. Yeah. Sorry, I'm getting there. Okay. Yeah. So I think this is actually, yeah, a very important question because th this is a, um, if you like, a sort of a smoking gun for whether this model is actually correct. <laughs> because the question of, well, what is this state? Well, this is an excited, um electronic state and um some people would call it the twin state because we shake mm -hmm. and um and so um in this excited state the the um the one of the signatures of it and this you do see this twin state in um benzene and semi valvoline not which are not hydrogen bonding but there's an analogous thing where you've got these two coupled electronic states. And one of the signatures of it is that this state um, is, is harder, as in, sorry, the frequency, the oscillation frequency is larger than it is in the ground state. And now that's the opposite of what normally happens with chemical bonds. Normally when you go to the excited state, the bond is, is, is softer. Um, and you do see this in benzene. And so um, 
the I would love to see someone do an experiment looking for this um, uh, for this state, but you should also see it in the in the quantum chemistry. Um, and so this is one um, example uh, where um, this melon aldehyde here. Um, again, this is another Indian paper, Mahaparata. And so, um, yeah, that, that they see it in the quantum chemistry, um, this excited state. So it should be there in um, high enough level quantum chemistry calculations, but you should be able to see it experimentally. So I, I would like it if people, you know, looked for it, yeah. If I can comment, uh, make a sort of, uh, well, first of all, uh, this uh, hardening of the excited state frequencies are there also in polyacetylene. You remember for sure in the old time of polyacetylene. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, apart from that, uh, I have uh, a comment perhaps uh, for the people working on uh, these uh, strange uh, excited state uh, in, uh, 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 sorry, in um, aggregate of uh, amyloids or, or things like that. Could this strange uh, excited state, this strange fluorescence come from this uh, phantom state and this uh, hydrogen, strongly hydrogen bonded system? This is a question. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm not qualified to answer. Can you, just so I'm clear, you're saying in the, some of the amyloids? This exactly. Is there, yeah. there is fluorescent, an unexpected fluorescence. Unexpected fluorescence in amyloids. Okay. No, I don't, yeah, no, I'd have to, maybe you could send me, yeah, we could correspond on email. I would sure. be interested to know more the, about the, that. The experts here are uh, Luca Grisanti, Ali Asanali, so they are really experts in the field. Yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. that Ali has a comment, possibly. Yes, uh, thanks, Christina. Thanks, uh, Ross. Good to see you. I, uh, so I, uh, well, I have, I have two curiosities uh, before I get to Anna's question. So the, the first one is, you, so you know that D2O is uh, toxic, right? I mean, life, life did not uh, emerge in D2O. Um, and so my first question is, you know, the percentage of short hydrogen bonds that are 2.4 is, they're, they're not insignificant, but it's not that they have a large proportion of them. So oh, I was wondering, do you, have, um, do you have a sense on um, why life did not uh, evolve in D2O and it is, can it be related somehow to these uh, subtle differences in uh, how things change in these potential energy surfaces? So, so that's number one. Number two is, uh, I don't know if you know this, but um, D2O uh, actually tastes sweeter than H2O. Mm -hmm. And um, there have been some speculations and ideas on uh, how this may be related to subtle hydrogen bonding effects with sweet receptors in, in the tongue. These may seem like very esoteric questions, but I'm just curious uh, if how to, yeah, how to relate these to these things. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's interesting. So the first, um, yeah, okay, about, yeah, complexities of origins of life and life evolving and so on. I mean, there just isn't much D2O in the, the um, you know, in the universe, so to speak. So, right. so I think it might be a bit unfair to say that, you know, suppose everything was D2O, we don't know. We don't have a what do they call a counterfactual. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that would be one um, thing. Um, uh, but I, but I, but then I'd also say. I mean, I'd agree with what you were saying earlier that that um, that it's um, that these these short hydrogen bombs are very rare. I mean, that in terms of a percentage. You know, so you can find hundreds of, you know, you can find hundreds of proteins in which there's a couple of these short hydrogen bonds, and often they are near an active site for some functionality. 
But the, first of all, it's only a few of the bonds within one protein. And then most of the, you know, the 99% or even more of the proteins, you don't have these short hydrogen bonds. Um, right, right. So, yeah, so I don't, I, yeah, I'm, to me, that shows that, yeah, I, I just, I'm always skeptical. Uh, uh, yeah, that just that these are, you know, I think they're fascinating from a science mm. point of view. And there are certain specific systems in which they're certainly important. But yeah, I, I really am not convinced that yeah. for most of biology that they really do. do yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah but thanks. Those good questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, now I remember, you, Ali, you, you, yeah. you've worked on the amyloid thing, right? You, that's, you that's, my, that's yeah. right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, oh, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, well, you know, I mean, Luca can chime in here as well, but, um, you know, before this work with Luca, we, we thought that short hydrogen bonds were, and this is a response to Anna's question, that short hydrogen bonds could be one of these, uh, the origins of this anomalous um, fluorescence. But it turns out that there are systems without the short hydrogen bond that also exhibit this. Right. I know. So, so I, 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 yeah, I, I can't say that this is um, uh, the, the necessary criteria to, yeah, to see yeah. it. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, we have another uh, question in the chat. I know that we are running out of time, but since uh, after that we have the poster session, maybe we can at least comment about this. Ross, can you read, because the, okay. Yeah. In an escape route from in out of a protein, would it be more efficient to have a restricted high dense area of receptors rather than just one? I mean, do these acceptor act as competitors for each other or do they kind of help the rate of the electron escape? Okay. So this is, I think, to do with just with charge transfer, electron transfer. Um, and so, yeah, it seems, again, I'm no you know, expert on electron transfer and proteins, but it just seems generally that most biomolecules, you know, things are, are very specific <laughs> in terms of that you've just got one donor and one acceptor. Occasionally, you know, there's exceptions. People talk about bifurcated hydrogen bonds, for example. And they do occur, but they're pretty rare. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think that it's probably, um, uh, yeah, generally there's just going to be one acceptor. You know, maybe there would be, maybe there would be two. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's answering the, the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Go okay. So uh, let me thank again Professor Ross McKenzie for this uh, very interesting lecture. And uh, now it is time for the coffee break. And uh, we will be here in 10 minutes for the poster session. <laughs>